You will see Israel reformed in the bulletin. It says Israel revived. That's my uh, uh, inconsistency there, but I'll show you that they're related. Really, it doesn't matter. Because in the book of Second Chronicles, we have a beautiful story of how God raised up godly leaders who set about to straighten out the mess that others have made. And so once again, we see that Second Chronicles, the books of First and Second Chronicles, differ some from the kings in that they show the internal life of Israel and how God was working through a godly remnant to bring about revival. Now in Second Chronicles chapter 34, we're going to begin in verse 8. And this tells about the reforms, the revivals under the good king Josiah, who became a king when he was only eight due to the passing of his father. And we're just going to read a few verses here, and then I'll be referring to some other passages in the text later. But it says in the 18th year, verses 8 now of the 34th chapter, in the eighth year, 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, who kept the doors, had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, and which they had brought back to Jerusalem. When they had put it in the hand of the foreman, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. They gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy hewn stone and timber, for beams and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jahath and Obadiah, the Levites, of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah and Meshulam of the sons of Kohathites, to supervise. Others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over all the burden bearers, and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. Now I want you to especially notice, and this is the last verse I'm going to read right now, but this 14th verse is probably a key to this whole passage and maybe the whole book of Second Chronicles. But it says, Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. While the priest was working in the temple, repairing and bringing about changes, he made a discovery that changed history and changed the nation. Israel reformed and revived. Sovereign God is always at work. And in these dark days of Israel, following the split of the kingdom after Solomon's death, there were many wicked kings. In fact, the northern kingdoms had a succession of evil kings. But in the south, in Judah, where the temple was, there were some godly kings raised up. And through their leadership, Positive changes were made. How important it is, brothers and sisters, that we have godly leaders in important positions in the church and in the nation. When godly leaders return to the word, there is revival and reform. I think there is a little difference in revival and reform. Revival is when the Holy Spirit is poured out. Revival is God's side. It's not something you can work up. It's something that comes from heaven. Pentecost was a great revival as the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples and 3,000 were saved. We've seen wonderful awakenings here in America. The first great awakening in the 1730s under Whitfield and Wesley and Edwards. The second great awakening 
in the early 1800s as thousands were converted in Virginia and Kentucky and Pennsylvania and other states. Reform is what happens as a result of revival. Reform is the ethical changes that take place in society, that cures the evils of society, that result from revival. Now, you might be able to have reformation without revival, but you can't have revival without reformation. I personally believe, this is my conviction, that many of the moral causes that we've been fighting for throughout the past decades, such as the problem of pornography and drug addiction and abortion, will never be solved just by legislation or by battles in Congress or in the Supreme Court, although I think that's important, and I will be a part of it. It will never happen until God moves in the hearts of people, until God changes people's thinking, changes mothers so they will not want to abort their little ones, changes young people so they will not want to destroy their lives with drugs or with alcohol. Now, there are three kings that I would like to mention that emerge in Second Chronicles that did a wonderful job of changing things. One named was Asa, who came on the scene. Another was Hezekiah, who initiated a powerful reform, who feared God, who loved God, and who brought about some marvelous changes. But the one we're focusing on Today is this young man named Josiah who came on the scene in desperately bad times. And something amazing happened while he was fixing up the temple. Evidently the temple had fallen into disrepair. It was dirty apparently. It needed to be refurbished. And so he set some people at work. He took up collections and he hired some people to repair the temple to rebuild it. And Hilkiah the priest was setting about doing this and suddenly he looked in a certain place and there was this old book probably covered with dust. And he got it and he looked at it and lo and behold, it was the Word of God. The laws of Moses. Can you imagine that Israel, Judah, the nation that was supposed to follow God had buried the Word. It was lost. And because the Word was lost, corruption and evil filled the land. Well, Hilkiah took it to the scribe, and the scribe then passed the Word on to the king himself. And when Josiah looked into the book, he tore his clothes. He was so upset, he fell on his face. And he said, no wonder we're in the mess we're in. We have deserted the Word of God. Now that brings me to my first point today. And that is when there's revival and when there's reform in the house of God, whether we're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, we have to return to the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, there will never be change in the church apart from the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can save souls. It's the only thing that can change hearts. Let me give you a kind of an illustration from the scriptures to show you how this works. You remember the story of young David who went out against Goliath, that great champion of the Philistines. He was nine feet tall, and he was standing out on a mountain, defying the armies of God. And here on the other side of the valley was King Saul of Israel, intimidated, frightened. He didn't know what to do. And little David had come into the battle camp, to bring some food to his brothers. He was just a young chap. And he saw this scene and it stirred his heart. He saw this mighty giant over here with the enemies of God 
just cursing and swearing and defying the Lord God of heaven. And he began to inquire, and he said, who's going to take this man on? No one would. And so David said, I will. Just a shepherd boy. Now, of course, you can imagine what the reaction was. The king wanted him to put on this heavy coat of armor, but he tried it and it wouldn't fit. He said, well, I was out in the fields and I was attending to my sheep when a bear came and God delivered the bear into my hand. And then there was a lion and God gave me the strength to kill the lion so I could protect my sheep. Now God will deliver that Philistine into my hands. And so as the both armies looked on in astonishment. This young chap, fresh from the fields, walked down into the valley and took a stone from the brook. And he put it in his sling. And in that brief conversation and confrontation with the giant, the giant said, Why, young man, I'm going to destroy you, so the birds are going to come and eat your body. And David said, you've come to me with a huge sword and with a spear and with a staff, but I have come in the name of the Lord. And so David was with God and God was with David and he caused his sling to go round and round and hurled it and it went straight in between the eyes of that mighty giant and he fell dead, stone dead. Then he took the sword of the giant and cut off his head. And the enemies of God fled. Later on in his life, David was a refugee. He was fleeing from the king. And he went in to the place where that sword was lying. And he needed a weapon. It was once again a time of difficulty and travail in Israel. When he was vulnerable and he saw that sword there, the sword that he'd used to kill Goliath several years before, and he said, I will take this sword to go out against my enemies. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like this sword. You know, brothers and sisters, the Bible says the the scriptures are the sword of the Lord. This is our armament. This is what we use as an offensive weapon against the enemies of God. The preaching of the truth is what causes the enemies of God to run. The truth about who God is. The truth about Jesus and His shed blood. Oh, may we never desert the sword of the Word. There's nothing like it. Just as David said, there's nothing like this sword that I used against Goliath. And let me just challenge these 10 or 12 precious young people who graduated from high school and college. Let me encourage you in your times of confusion to turn to the Word. In my little note to you at the beginning of these books, I cited a verse of Scripture from Proverbs chapter 3, which tells us that God will guide us as we face the decisions of life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. You need direction. We all need direction. We face decisions in life. We face crises in life. We move from one phase of our lives to another. And in all of those instances, we will find the Word of God a safe guide. And I want to tell you from experience, friends. I remember when I graduated from high school. And I recall when I graduated from college. The trauma that went on in my mind. The fear, yes. Will I get a job? Will I survive? Will I find that special person? Will I succeed or will I fail? Ah, yes, I was afraid, but I asked God to guide me. 
And I found that special person. And I found a place to preach the word. And God has been with me. And I give him the glory. Now, all great revivals, all great reforms come about through a rediscovery of the word. And when Hilkiah the priest found the word, things began to change. And my friends, after the medieval period when there was so much corruption and superstition and darkness in the church, some men of God whose names we've heard over and over again, Knox, Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, rediscovered the Word and they preached it. And Europe was turned upside down Second thing that happens when reform takes place is repentance. There's got to be repentance before there can be change in the church. Repentance hurts because who wants to admit you're wrong? Repentance means to say, God, I've been backslidden. I've departed from you. I need to come back to you. This is what happened to Josiah. When he read in the law, he read about how God had made a covenant with his people. How God had said, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you follow me, you'll be a happy, joyful, prosperous people. But if you turn away from me, you will be cursed. Your enemies will prevail against you. Ah, brothers and sisters, it's that way in our families. It's that way in our individual lives. When we desert God, we're defeated. We're overcome by our enemies. Sin overcomes us. And I'm persuaded it's that way with our nation. When this nation has returned to God, and when there's been repentance in the churches, when people have wept over their sins, it's been a prelude to change spiritually. Can't you just see this young king? His, his heart is broken. He reads in the, in the Word about how God is holy and God takes His law seriously. But He's a godly king. He doesn't rebel. He doesn't turn away from the Word like some of the evil kings did. He humbles himself before God, and he acknowledges that God is sovereign. And it tells us down in verse 27 of this chapter that God acknowledged Josiah's humiliation and repentance. God acknowledged it. He says, because your heart was tender, this is verse 27 of chapter 34, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against the inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. I want to ask you today, has God changed? Is anything different? Oh, yes, we have computers. They didn't. We have satellites flying around the earth. They didn't. We may dress a little different, but the situation is basically the change. God is holy. We're sinners. We need to come to God and fall on our faces and admit we've done wrong. As a nation, as families, as individuals. Why is repentance not being preached in many places today? Yes, it's true we have to accept Jesus. But maybe we've overworked that expression, accept Jesus. We do accept Jesus, but when you accept Jesus, you turn from sin, you turn from the world. Solomon set the pattern in Chronicles, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. But now that brings me to the third thing. The third 
manifestation of reform in God's kingdom is removing idolatry. You see, when you start looking into the Word, when you start looking into the mirror of the Bible, it shows you where you're wrong and there may be idols in your life you have to get rid of. God's warning to the Christians in 1 John, the last part of that book is, My little children, keep yourselves from idols. Idols are those things that grip our hearts and keep us from our knees, that keep us from God's house, that keep us from prayer, that keep us from the Word. Of course, there are idols out in the church, idols out in the land. But it tells us down in verse 30 what Josiah did when he got a grip of the Word. Verse 30, the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Now, in verse 33 it says, thus Josiah removed all the abomination from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. This is revival, folk. He says we've got to clear house. We've got to change things. These idols to Baal and Astaroth have to go. And so I say, God says to the church today, these idols of lust have to go. These idols of pornography have to go. These idols of drunkenness have to go. These idols of envy have to go. Yes. We have to deal seriously with those things that hinder us from serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we need revival in the church today. And I know for a fact that there are some of you who are praying for it. That's encouraging to me. I've been praying for it. So has my wife. We've been praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no substitute for this. All of our programs and schemes will, might have some temporary effect and get people excited. But the Spirit has to change hearts. Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And now, brothers and sisters, I come to my fourth and final point, and that is that reform, reform involves reinstating the ordinances of divine worship. Now, this 35th chapter of Second Chronicles tells about a great celebration of the Passover. Isn't it amazing how the church, and I, I know I'm kind of picking on the church a little bit today, and I love the church, and I'm a part of it. But how the church, over a period of years, can, you know, start adding a lot of human opinions and traditions to what goes on, and forget that the simple plan of God is laid down in the New Testament. And at the heart, a revival is worshiping and doing what God commands. In the 35th chapter, the king, young king Josiah, had a, had the, I guess you'd say, the mother of all Passovers. They'd been neglecting this. They weren't praising God for redemption. They weren't killing the lambs and worshiping the God of atonement. And so he 
tells them once again to go back to the Passover. Return to God's ordinances. As we look at the New Testament, we find basically the solution to our problems are pretty simple. Go to church, pray, make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, fall in love with God, trust Jesus Christ as Savior, be baptized, be a part of His church, and then come and celebrate at the Lord's Supper what our Lord has done for us us. All the other inventions that we might devise cannot substitute for these things. And listen, if we have no heart for the simple ordinances of God, the fault is not in the Bible, it's in us. Y'all are awful quiet. I hear people say, the Bible is boring. Prayer is boring. That's not a commentary, my friends, on God. That's a commentary on you. I've got a little problem with my grandson. The only thing he wants to eat is macaroni and cheese. My daughter will fix a beautiful meal of meat, spinach, or whatever, potatoes, and he, he just pushes it aside. He wants macaroni and cheese. I'm concerned about the kid. You know, I'm concerned when people don't want to relish the Word. When they find the ordinances of divine worship boring and they have to have something else to scintillate them. So when God works, people are encouraged. Verse 2 and 35, it says, He set the priests in their duties and encouraged them. They're consecrated in verse 6. So the slaughter of the Passover offerings... Consecrate yourselves and prepare them for your brethren. Consecrate yourselves. We need holiness today in the church. And then they began to obey the Lord. Now, my friends, we're about to leave Kings and Chronicles. I've talked to you about Kings, about the political and military side in the brief times I've had. But then I joyfully have been able to tell you about revival in Chronicles. The good people. And I'll tell you there are good people out there now. There are good pastors. There are godly people who are praying. Join that great host who are fasting and praying for America. Join that great host who are depending not on our armaments and our nuclear weapons or even our armies, as great as they may be, but depend on Almighty God. Sometimes situations in our lives become so desperate that we have to turn to God. We try everything else. We try every scheme we can think of. And we sink deeper and deeper into the quicksand of our own confusion. And when that happens, we have to turn to God. We may as a nation be facing that right now. 3,000 people were killed two and a half years ago. A little less than that. But we faced these crises before. It was a dark hour when Adolf Hitler and his blitzkrieg raced across Europe. England wasn't prepared. America was asleep. America was pacifist. We want to stay out of it. And finally, the backbone of America bowed 
and we pray and we prevail and we'll prevail again if we pray to God but we won't prevail if we don't pray to God the hope of America is not in the Supreme Court it's in the church the hope of America is not in Congress It's in the groups of people who meet in homes and in churches to cry out to God for help. I know I'm right. How the conflict will come out, I don't know. Because I can't see the future. But I know that we must trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. And obey. I believe the Lord is, is, loves our country, but we're at a crossroads. We're at a crisis. We're compromised. We're backslidden. We need to turn to God. We're going to sing now, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.